Good morning. The Lord Christ be with you. My name is Kristen Jones. I'm one of the members here, and it's my honor to welcome each one of you to Mayfield First. Uh, we're so glad you joined us today. If you're watching through Facebook or YouTube, you can let us know uh, in the comments section. Also, you can let us know if you have a prayer request there. Our ongoing prayer list is on the screens behind me. Uh, if you didn't see all of the names, please refer to our newsletter and emails. They are also shown on the rotating screens as you walk into the sanctuary each Sunday morning. As always, please keep in mind the request and hold them in your prayers. Now to shout outs. Mary Wright, we love you, miss you, and hope you are doing well. Needline Food Pantry, thank you to this organization for their invaluable service you provide to our community. Their dedication to ensuring that those in need have access to nutritious food is truly a blessing. Congratulations to Michael Tucker and Aubrey Evans Tucker, who were united in marriage last weekend. We wish you both a lifetime of shared dreams, new adventures, and all the blessings that life can bring. And I'm gonna pull a Vanessa. I'm gonna add one in here. We would like to give a shout out to all the fathers here and watching on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you all. Sorry, Vanessa, I pick on you. I want to take an opportunity to remind you that worship is what we do. It's not just something you watch. Together, we are here to pray, glorify, and give thanks to God through Jesus Christ for all the blessings, benefits, and blessings of this life. Okay, our prayer to open worship is found in the bulletin and on the screens, so please read along with me. God of every thought and reality, the holy, prophetic, sustainer of community, we gather here today as your people, children of the good news. Assure us of your presence once again, that we may trust the mystery of the life and growth as we gather in the name of our Savior, who is Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please stand as we sing our first hymn, God of the Ages.
please join me in the prayer of illumination, which is found in your bulletin and on the screens. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture today is from Psalms 92, 1 through 4, and 12 through 15. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bring forth fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to show that the Lord is upright. The Lord is my rock in whom there is no unrighteousness. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Good morning. It's good to be with you all on this warm Sunday. I already miss winter, I'll be honest with you. I was out playing disc golf in the park the other day, and I barely made it through one round of disc golf because it was so hot out there. Oh, I know. But you know what? I am thankful that the sun is shining and the warmth of God's presence is with us every day. And I'm thankful to be all to, thankful to be all together with you all in the body of Christ this day. So as we go before God and feel his presence, let us go before him in prayer with our hearts open. Lord, as we still our hearts and our minds before you this day, this day, we remember your greatest and grace and love that you share with us. As we still the noise of the world, the strife, the pains, the frustrations, we remember the grace and the most giving love This day we remember all those who had been there for us as fathers in our life. Remember the current and even the past that have gone before us. We ask that you honor us as we remember them. Allow their gifts and their graces of their teachings to be with us as we continue each day. And most of all, we remember your teachings of love and peace as we walk through this journey we call in the kingdom of light here. As we continue through the kingdom, may we be present with those so that we don't evaluate the world in a wrongful way, but in the way you call us to, so that we can truly see the love as you have loved us. As we come before you, 
We remember those who are hurting. We remember those who are in pain. We remember those who have lost. We remember those who are without. We ask that you guide and be with us so that we may be present with them. May your presence be an ever warmth in their life and an ever present peace. As we continue in your love, be present with our world as it struggles. Struggles to see you and to experience the peace that you give. The peace through your son, Jesus Christ. That grace and ever loving presence. And most of all, we ask that you be present with us when we fall. When we backslide and fail in your lies. May your grace, grace ever be present and loving in every moment, waiting for us as we reach out to you. And when we do fall, we remember the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Stand once again as we sing, It is well with my soul.
It's now time of giving or our tithes and offerings. I remind you our offering boxes are up front or in the back. You're welcome to give before or after service. Also through the office and online through PayPal. Let us go to God in prayer as we bless him of the gifts. Lord, we thank you for all the gifts you've bestowed on us, both physical and spiritual. As we continue to give of you and the kingdom here in this world now, may we continue to give to you the giving of love and peace. In your name, amen. Him, it is well with my soul. If you have never heard the backstory of that hymn, you need to listen to it. Just search it on YouTube. But it was written by Horatio Sparato, if I say his last name right. But he lost everything. He lost his family, all his money, everything. And that is when, when he was at the rock bottom, he wrote that song. It is well with my soul. And that kind of goes along with what Paul is talking about today. He, Paul has faced many trials and tribulations, and still he sings of God's grace and praise, to even to the church of Corinth, who is struggling and fighting, as many do in the world around us. So we'll be hearing from our, uh, Paul from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 6 through 10 and uh, verses 14 through 20. And I'll be reading out of the message version. That's why we live with such good cheer. You won't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. Cramped conditions here won't, don't get us down. They only remind us of the spacious living conditions ahead. It is what we trust in, don't yet see, but keeps us going. Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us? When the time comes, we'll be plenty, plenty ready to exchange exile for homecoming. But neither exile nor homecoming is the main thing. Cheerfully pleasing God is the main thing. And that's what we aim to do, regardless of our conditions. Sooner or later, we'll have all to, we all, we all have to face God, regardless of our conditions. We will appear before Christ and take what's coming to us as a result of our actions, either good or bad. Our firm decision is to work from, from this focused sinner, one man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could be also included in his life, a resurrection life, a far brighter life than people ever lived on their own. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We look at the Messiah the way once and got all got it all the, we look at the Messiah that way once and we got it all wrong as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start and is created new. The old self is gone. A new life emerges. Look at it. All this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him, then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. 
God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Because become friends with God. He's already a friend of you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. So in the previous passages of Paul's Second Corinthians, he has dealt with life eternal and how mortal existence is the prelude to what is to come. And he is trying to get us to see what is now. You know, Paul sees that there is a promise of eternal life. He says, you know, what? that is why we live with such good cheer here. You won't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. The cramped conditions here won't get us down. That only reminds us of the spacious living conditions ahead. Paul is getting us to see of what is to come. The greatness that God has given us through the grace of love of Jesus Christ. Now he trusts that death is simply a bridge between these linking worlds. Maurice Boyd writes of a bridge in Europe engraved with these words. Bridges are meant to cross over. No one builds his house there, so it is with life. The journey is exciting. We love it and we wish to linger, but ultimately this life is a bridge between worlds and home awaits on the other side. And this is what Paul is getting us to understand, that yes, we live here, but there is so much greater through Christ. But why we're here, we have work to do. Why we're here, we still have that promise of life to come, but we have what Paul says, workings of the kingdom. Paul looks at the transformation that he experienced. He says, so anyone in Christ, there is new creation. Everything old has passed away and everything has become new. Everything has become new. Paul experiences transformation himself on that road to Damascus. So do we experience that same transformation? How do we experience transformation? Well, I can attest to several situations and many families that I have experienced transformation through working with children's services and working with substance people struggling with substance abuse. As many families, they felt lost. They would come to me and struggle and not know what to do. Slowly, they faced turmoil after turmoil, and oftentimes, I was seen as the bad guy. And oftentimes, they would try to shut me out. But with persistence, as my job was, with persistence, I sought to love them, and I sought to care for them, as Christ did. And as that same love and persistence kept going, they eventually began to see the gifts of transformation. They began to see the experience that they could have on the other side of harm and frustration, and they began to experience healing. So many of those families, they never said thank you, and I was okay with that. Because I, you know why? Every time I left the family, I said, I don't want to ever see you again. Because every time I would see them, they were at their worst. So it was with a joy when I never got a call about another family again, because I knew they were doing okay. And they were healing. And I didn't do that healing. They did the healing. And most of them did the healing through work and frustrations, but also with the love. How many times have you faced a time where you had to face transformation? 
have you experienced a transforming experience in your life that you can only attest to God's presence in you? Many Now, if I remember the transformation from when I was little to where I am now, I will attest, as it is Father's Day, I can attest that there was many father figures in my life. Many, many father figures through my times in scouting, my times in football, and many of my experiences in church. I was not the easiest child. I've told you that over and over again. I know it's weird to see, but they had grace and patience for me that I could never, ever, ever say thank you enough for. I remember one time uh, in Scouts, there was a good friend of the family, and he really was trying to get me to understand the way life was going to be. And I wouldn't listen. And eventually, I now I look back and I say, man, I should have listened. I should have listened to that father figure then because I wouldn't have been running through exile, as Paul says, and figured out sooner or later that he was right in my life. You know, Paul is trying to get us to see the world around us to see the turmoil that is there. He's talking to the church of Corinth who is also present in their time, their time of seeing how the world is to live, how the churches exist. And he has some good words for us today. We see there is a a personal friend who I read this story today, this week, personal friend of this Uh, story is whose life crumbled painstakingly rebuilt a new and devoted Christian identity he concluded the statements of the phrase that was my former life for him the new birth of that Christ described to Nicodemus and Paul affirmed in this passage was a moment of starting over my friend he says became a new person So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Everything that was before has become old, and through Christ, everything has become new. So if that is the case for Paul, he's trying to get the church in Corinth to understand that through Christ, everything is new through him why do we hold on to the past? Why do we hold on to the critiques of the world around us? Why do we hold on to the frustrations and judgments of the world, but not only the world, but each other? Paul continues in verses 16 and 17. He says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. When a person has experienced this rebirth, this is not our role to judge, but when sincerity to love them and to see them not as their former self, but as their new self in Christ. Now, I'll tell you a story, and Karen may get mad at me for sharing this today. Or she may say this is the truth. So, she hated when I worked for children's services because I went through a lot of trainings and I went through many, many times of trainings and hours of training working on how to walk into situations and to judge a situation really quickly. It was really a lot of situational awareness and in those, I was trained uh, two or three weeks by the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, and they taught me all the investigation techniques. So just beware, I'm a TBI trained <laughs> pastor. I know, David, I know you see you shaking your head at me. <laughs> but in that time, in all those trainings, I began to have this sixth sense and this pre 
judgment, I like to call it. Almost to the time I hate, Karen hated me going to, with her to Walmart. <laughs> because you walk through Walmart and you're like, okay, I know that person, I know that person, I know this person. Just by their situation or who, what they look like. I was just going off how they were acting. I was going off how they looked. I was going off what they wore. Just like the TV I had trained me, you know, I look for what they're, how they're moving and sh shaking. I don't know what they were doing. To the point where Karen says, why are you judging and why are you critiquing everybody we walk by? How much of the world does this now? How much do we do this every day, even when we walk into Walmart? Now, I still hate going into Walmart. Karen and I, or the kids and I went to Walmart when Karen was gone, and I just, it gives me an anxiety attack to walking in there. But I have transformed, and I have let go of many of those trainings or those prejudgments of critiquing. I had to. Because in Christ, we are called to see everybody as new. We are born anew in Christ. And we are called to see everybody as one with Christ. So in that letting go of those judgments, I was taught the hard way not to see people in the worldly way. That is a jarring thing for Paul, isn't it? Paul who, you know, he was saying that we are to be only seen through faith, through Christ, but also through our good works, right? Paul is usually emphasizing justification by grace through faith and mentions that all be judged according to what they have done in the body. In the body, not in the prior life. Not in the ecstatic experiences. Life in the body is to be real and earnest. Does Paul contradict himself? No, a righteous life is expected at the judgment. But it is accomplished not by trying to achieve a righteousness of one's own, but receiving a righteousness from God. And that is through the grace and gift of Christ. Now, exactly how to say this has been debated through the centuries is the least a way to say it. Catholics emphasize the good works are the one's true, his own self, and therefore meritous, through though they may be possible through grace. Protestants emphasize that good works, while expected, can never be adequate by themselves but God treats them as though they were adequate because of Christ's own righteousness for us. Either way, the true judge will be Christ, the one who surprised many by proclaiming the priority of love over law and inviting sinners to receive the grace of God. There is four quick images of this I want to share. Christ's love holds us together. All believers do. It contains constraints and controls a positive sense of empowering and giving consistency. It does not compel or confine. Christ's love holds us together. If we let go of those prejudgments and those critiques and those analytical thoughts in our head of others, and experience the true love, we would see that Christ calls us to be held together. Christ died for all, therefore all have died. And because of this, we are able to die ourselves to Christ. For Paul, this is a crucial question, is how we can make this transition from one system salvation of obedience to law, as Paul came from, to another, righteousness through God's gift of grace and faith. The transition is not easy. It happens through death. 
those who are crucified with Christ die to the law and through the law. Scripture consigned all things to sin so that salvation would be through faith. So how does this happen? This, the cross, discredits all who claim superior righteousness, power, and wisdom. The powers that rule the world would never be crucified, would not have crucified the Lord of glory, Paul said, if they had understood the wisdom of God. One who knew no sin was made sin, being treated as an evildoer. Living by the system of salvation based on the law turns out to be a massive blunder for us leading to discrediting in the entire attitude that the righteousness is gained by the obedience to the law. This approach is not only unfeasible for us, it is unfeasible for us, but leads to hypocrisy, self-righteousness, abuse of power, scapegoating, and unjust condemnation. That's where we start to critique where we start to judge and we start to see others as lesser when we start to say we are doing the right thing or we are doing what God calls us to do in the way that the law says. God's disapproval of this indicates by raising Jesus from the dead and exalting him as Lord and judge. What comes not to be, what could not be attained through the law can now be received through faith in God's promises. And God promises love and grace in the rightful restoring relationship with him through that love and grace. And the third thing is, therefore, Christ is no longer known after the flesh. Paying, my, paying too much attention to the outward appearances, you know, those home, the homeless people that come to and around you, we criticize, you may be able to criticize them and say, why aren't they working, what are they doing? But do we truly know what they have gone through or what they are going through? Have we really experienced who they are or their experiences as they have experienced? You know, so we, you know, paying too much to this uh, homeless lifestyle, his eating and with sinners, you know, his emphasis on love rather than external law leads some of us to view him as a deceiver. We see Christ as a deceiver if we view it as the law, a lawbreaker, a revolutionary person in this world who received his just deserts on the cross. But now there's a massive reversal that takes place the love of Christ, the love for all and those who are born anew. This new creation, the old has passed away, a new has come. This does not mean disappearance from the old and a flesh become, there's more like a recreation inside of us, a transformation of all humanity that is already created but is subjected to sin and death. Paul has already spoken of this renewal. The inner person, while the outward person is wasting away, as we heard last week, our inward being is created anew while the outward is falling apart. This renewal is to allow us to restore our relationship with God. Through Christ's love and grace, we are restored anew we are righted with God. And when we are righted with God, we really see the true grasp of God's love for us because we begin to experience the transformation. And then from that transformation, we begin to see the, how we are called to be the persons and people to go out into the world to transform the kingdom here. What did Paul say? We are the Christ representatives. We're Christ representatives. So if we are born anew and all are born anew, we are called 
even to going into Walmart to share the love of Christ. So when you walk out into the world, may you be Christ's representative, seeing that the world has changed through Christ. May you share that love so that the world changes even more. Because through Christ, we are all righted in the right relationship with God. So as you go forth this week, may your presence be healing. May your presence be loving. And may your presence be grace-filled in every time you walk and be with everybody in this world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. While Lisa is getting ready, um, I've got a quick announcement. Mark, David, and Tommy, see me after class. I'm, I'm just See me at your service. I know we'll talk to you three. The rest of everybody else and them can please stand as we sing our last hymn, Make Me a Captive Lord. <clears throat> this benediction. May you go forth knowing that you are born anew with Christ this day. Go forth with his grace and love ever present through you and around you. Amen.